This episode of Suds with Luds is brought to you by Early Bird Gummies. Early Bird Gummies are a recreational hemp product and contain 2.5 milligrams of natural THC and 12.5 milligrams of CBD in each gummy. They are formulated with a microdose of THC and are designed to make you feel good. We often say that Early Bird will put a smile on your face and are great for taking the edge off. The Suds with Luds discount code is SUDS, S-U-D-S. Good for 20% off a customer's first purchase. For me, take them at bedtime. Helps me get a great sleep at night. Try our early bird gummies. Welcome to another episode of Suds with Luds. And uh, today, uh, I, the, the first word that came to my mind when I was thinking about how this show may go was... Uh, sideways and entertainment, and and that's exactly what we're about. Uh, I am pleased to introduce to everyone Mike Commodore. Kami, how are you? Doing good, lads. Yeah, I long, long time me. NHLer. I, you know what? I was going through our stuff here, and we got more in common than I actually figured, and we never even played against each other. What was your first year? Two th- ninety nine or two thousand? My first year, my yeah. first year was ninety seven, ninety eight. So right after that, uh, right after that hundred year flood in nineteen ninety seven, the next year was my freshman year. Yeah, and I stayed for three years, just like you. Okay, we so we did have a lot of similarities, except your career was about times three of mine. <laughs> it was like pretty similar. You know, I, you should be sitting in here with me because you know, one of our partners in this is Herman Marshall Whiskey. So I, I thought you may enjoy that if we could actually did this in person. But I, I would have asked you to do it at the Big Heart Celebrity Challenge, but that would be like putting gas on a fire. Yeah, I probably had enough to drink <laughs> at the old Big Hearted. I don't think I needed it. I do enjoy whiskey, but I think that would have been a total waste of good whiskey. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, definitely well served. But I am coming back to Dallas in March uh, when the Flames are in town, so I'll have to have some then. Oh, no, no, no. Are you really? How long are you in town for? I'm doing a little thing with Sportsnet. Um, they just, it's like, a, you know, customers and people that, you know, advertise and mm-hmm. stuff. I don't do anything for Sportsnet anymore up here in Calgary, but they just want a couple guys to come along. So I think it's, uh, I think it's March 5th to 8th. So there must be a Flames game in there somewhere, the 6th or 7th, probably. Uh oh. <laughs> I don't know. I, I will, uh, I'll make it a point. Okay. Uh, I'll mark it down on the calendar as soon as we're done with this thing. So I wanted to talk to you. Um, your, your hometown is what? Fort Saskatchewan, right? Yeah, right outside Edmonton, yeah. Okay, so you played your first year, it looked like, junior for in the, in the AJ, I believe, right? Yeah, right at home. Right okay, so you were, Traders. yeah, so they obviously had a dibs on you and you weren't going anywhere, or I'm sure you had other places to go. But I was curious, when did you get on the radar for the University of North Dakota? <laughs> well, it's actually how it ended up working out. Long story short, um, when I was in grade 11 was my first year midget. Uh, I wasn't very good. I enjoyed playing hockey. I was way better at baseball in the summers, but I, I just liked competing and I liked, you know, uh, the athletics, period. Uh, I had a terrible year in midget, broke my ankle, wasn't very good. The next year, I, I was drafted, though, in the Bantam draft in the last round a couple years prior by the Tacoma Rockets, which ended up by that time when I was in grade 11, they had moved to Kelowna. Um I the only thing I knew was was the Western Hockey League and, and the Canadian Hockey League major junior hockey. I didn't know anything about U.S. college hockey, and when I mean I, I, I didn't know anything, I honestly couldn't have named a team. I'd never seen a game. I, I didn't even know it existed. So my grade 12 year, before my grade 12 year, so after my midget year, I go to camp uh, for the Kelowna Rockets. Something clicks. I I don't even can't really explain it, but I got significantly better. They wanted to keep me. My parents were both educators. My mom was a principal. My dad was a speech pathologist. Back in those days, it's way better now, but back in those days, my mom got all the horror stories about guys going off to major junior and either not going to class or, you know, credits don't transfer and and they don't end up graduating high school. My mother wouldn't let me stay uh, after training camp and go to Kelowna. She said, look, if you're good enough to play for the Kelowna Rockets, you should be good enough to play for the Fort Saskatchewan Traders. So play here, finish your high school, do whatever you want. So I didn't really have a choice in the matter. So it sounded <laughs> like a good deal to me. Uh, so I went back. And so to answer your question, about a month into the season, maybe six weeks into when I was playing my one year in the Alberta Junior Hockey League, I was. it was after practice. 
and our head coach Doug Shum came down and into the locker room. He goes, "Hey, Mike, uh, the U's upstairs. They want to talk to you. You should go talk to this guy." I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, sure, coach." And I'm like, "Be you." Well, you don't even have a clue what BU is, do you? No idea. <laughs> no clue. And so I'm like, okay. So I go upstairs. There's a guy waiting there. He's like, hey, Mike, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? He's like, uh, yeah, you know, you ever think about going to college hockey? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Meanwhile, I don't have a clue. I'm like, BU. So he hands me the little program or whatever for the school. And I look at the front of it. I'm like, oh, Boston University. I go, okay. So kind of BS with him a little bit. Never been anywhere near Boston. Um, so once one came, then more came. So Boston University was the first one. They never came back. Uh, I want to say maybe Colorado <laughs> College came, um, maybe Wisconsin, but North Dakota was one of the first ones. And North Dakota was the first team that they offered me a fly down, which I didn't know what that was either. And they're like, no, no. And I'm like, I'll ask my parents. They're like, no, your parents don't come. It's just you. I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. awesome. That sounds great. So I flew down and, and basically I, w I was blown away. Um, with the, uh, you know, you know, the, the arena's packed, you know, it was my first time being out of the house by myself. You know, the team was pretty good. I, I, I was just blown away really by the atmosphere in that old rink. Um, and that was it. I decided, you know what, I'm not going to, I've been to some major junior games. There's some good major junior spots too. I'm not, I'm not shitting on major junior at all. Uh, but for me, I was like, you know what, I can get an education playing professional hockey, never crossed my, my mind. I just was like, ah, I get a little bit of a scholarship. And so that was the first time college hockey came across my radar. How, how were your grades coming, coming into North Dakota? Like when, when you went to school, were you a good student? Uh, yeah. I mean, I had to be, cause like yeah. I said, my mother was the principal. <laughs> so when I was in grade 12, I didn't miss a class. Like it didn't matter where our bus trips were. We could have been up in Fort McMurray getting home at six in the morning. I was going to be at school at eight 30. Uh, my, my grades were like, uh, I mean, I was good in like in, in math was kind of a thing I was decent at the, the English social studies stuff. I wasn't great at, but I was like, a. I think it'd be pretty fair to say like a B student, mm -hmm. something like that. So you, you know, like so, 80%. Yeah. So you, that, that's why you ended up getting that, that full ride or full or partial, whatever they offer you to start with. Cause I can tell you a little story when you mentioned Wisconsin. So, you know, I'm from Wisconsin. I, mm -hmm. uh, Badger Bob, Bob Johnson at the time, um, you know, and again, I'm from a small town, four hours from there, kind of knew there was this kid. I got offered a scholarship. Uh, to go to the University of Wisconsin. And it turned into a big thing in my home little, uh, obviously, you know, from 1,200 people, they're talking about going and playing, uh, you know, big time hockey, college hockey and all this kind of stuff. And I get a call back about uh, a couple weeks later and it was coach Bob Johnson. And he just said to me, he goes, uh, Miss Ludwig, how you doing? Good, good, good. And he goes, hey, uh, are you aware that the University of Wisconsin, we have a uh, grade point uh, average of 2.5 minimum. You know, that's what your grade point's gotta be and things like that. Yeah. And I'm like, no coach I, I had no idea and he goes well son you're not even close to that and so out that door that went that so that door shut and then um i found out that the university of north dakota was 2.0 and uh yeah. so it lowered it a little bit for me and then i had Perfect. a a really good athletic director slash principal at the time and with a little maneuvering and using my gym classes, they got me to a 2.0. <laughs> and so I was able to, to go there, walk on um, to University of North Dakota. And, and you know, and again, it, it played out uh, super well for me. And they took care of me, obviously, there as they do everybody else. What was your, your impression in your first month or so of college life and being a fighting Sioux? Yeah, it, it was interesting because... Um... You know, I go down on that visit when I'm in grade 12 and, and I sign my letter of intent in the new year. So we're talking about like February, March of 1997. Um, so now I'm, you know, trying to pay attention to North Dakota and, and it just so works out. I think the first, other than the flight out games, I think the first college hockey game that I watched on TV, um, cause it was actually on TV in Canada was North Dakota winning the national championship in 1997 in Milwaukee. I think they, they played BU maybe in the finals. It was something like that. Uh -huh. Anyway, they won. Um, so after that, I remember switching. Like, I'm like, you know, I'm excited. I'm like, okay, I'll be down there. I have baseball to take care of. I'm playing some Team Alberta baseball, but I'm looking forward to get down there. And, you know, a couple of weeks after that North Dakota game in the finals, um, you know, I'm clicking through TV and – I'm clicking through the news and there's like an aerial shot of a downtown core that is flooded 
Oh, and yeah. It's burning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in my head, I'm, you know, I'm just clicking through the channels and I'm, I, you know, click through and I'm like, oh, man, that would suck to be there. Right after that <laughs> thought goes through my mind, the little ticker, Grand Forks, North Dakota. Yeah. I'm like, holy shit, I'm going to be there in five months. <laughs> so anyways, get to, Cl- or get to Grand Forks uh, the following September. Um, but yeah, like, the, you know, the university was fine, but, you know, the the town was 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 in in rough shape but you know my first month i would say it was like i would say my first a couple weeks i remember when my dad dropped me off at college he said hey take care of your grades don't do anything stupid oh we're good 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 one i'm like (laughs) yeah i'm like okay sounds good um and i was homesick i would say for the only time in my life i would say that night not homesick but like when he left and i was in the walsh hall there the dorm and I'm like, man, I am on my own. That was like the one night. It wasn't even homesick. But it was just like, wow, this is something new. Um, Hockey-wise, like get, going around college, I really enjoyed that. You know, I, I made some friends quickly in the dorm. Um, the guys on the team were great. Hockey-wise, it was a real, like a real big, big eye-opener for me. Um, you know, they had an Ironman competition there with all these events. And, you know, I was 17 years old. I didn't turn 18. Yeah. I was by far the youngest guy on the team. I didn't turn 18 until November of my freshman year. So like, you know, we had this, I'd never worked out before in my life. Like nobody did. Mm-hmm. Like I, I think I'd maybe done like a bench press or two, maybe <laughs> at, at the high school gym. And, you know, we have a, this Ironman competition, you know, the average age of the guys other than me are 23, 22, 23, 24 years old. You know, I'm watching them in this Ironman competition. You know, you have to do your body weight, bench press. How many times I'm watching these guys crush it out like 25 times. And I'm like, Oh my God, I weigh 225 pounds. I'm like, I've never even attempted to lift anything like that before in my life. So needless to say, the Ironman competition was a complete disaster. I didn't get the bar off my chest Uh, dips. I was embarrassing. Basically anything like strength wise, I was a joke. Like just for my, you know, lifting that kind of weight with longer arms and, what I'm making excuses, but I, I just didn't know. I, I'd never lifted before. Thank God I could run. So at least I, I was okay there. Like I could get away with it. Um, but yeah, like it was exciting, but it was also eye opening. You know, the first practice with Dean Blaze, like it was just a bunch of stuff I'd never seen before. Like, I mean, it was fast paced. It was hard. I, I remember the first practice, I remember skating around towards like the end of it. And I'm like, holy shit. Like, I don't know if I'm going to make it through practice. But I'm like, just get through it, get through it. And so, you know, and it got better over time. But, yeah, I would say the whole experience was very, very eye-opening on pretty much every level for me. Yeah, they they really, what I had said uh, over the years after I left there and played pro for a while is that looking back, they really knew how to get you ready for the NHL, mm-hmm. you know, and that's what they were all about. They were about moving you on to the next level, giving you an opportunity, telling you who you were, what you were, and how you needed to play. Um, then you go on, you, you win a national championship your last year, right? That was your last year at school? Yeah, exactly, 2000. Is, is that what, were you leaving anyways? Were, were you going to leave after that year? Did that kind of, you know, put the put the mark on I'm taking off or, or I'm staying? That was, uh, I was... I was undecided. Um, I was having a good year. I'd been drafted the year prior um, or the summer prior. No, I was, I guess if I was leaning anyways, if we wouldn't have won that national championship, I'm about 99% sure that I would have came back. Um, I really wanted to win one. I watched him win one in 97. There's a history of winning there, you know, and and I'd never won anything in hockey and, and I knew we were close. So if we wouldn't have won my junior year, I would have came back. I'm not even going to say 99%. I would have for sure. After we won, I, I kind of had some decisions to make. I, I really wanted to come back for my senior year. We, we weren't losing very many guys. I knew we were, we, you know, barring injuries or, you know, something different happening, you know, we were going to have a good team again. Um, and they ended up going to the finals and losing to the Boston College in the exact same final the next year. What would it be my senior year? They lost in overtime. Um, but for me, it, went, it was it was kind of two things. First off, winning the national title, I was kind of like, hey, you know, we did it. You know, I was never playing for like personal stuff. I, mean, I was never an All American or not right. even close. Never yep. an All Star. Like that stuff, I didn't give a shit about because I had no chance, anyways. Yeah. So 
it was that um, winning. And then it actually kind of got to the point in college hockey for me where like I was getting penalties for hitting people too hard. Like it was clean and I wasn't, you know, I wouldn't consider myself a dirty player at all, Yeah. but you know, every once in a while I would, I would run somebody over pretty good, but not a charge. Like I got pretty good at catching guys at the blue line on my right side. I, I would catch guys when they looked down at the puck right around the blue line. I got kind of decent at that. And I would catch some guys and because of my size, I would steamroll them. And it was getting to the point where I was getting penalties. You were getting penalties because you were too there. big. They were penalizing you I for was. having good genes. Yeah. Yeah, we say yeah. it a lot in our, and again, you know, with our U18s and things like that, we see it. I mean, they get penalties because they're just too big and too strong than other kids that they're playing against. Although what it probably did is it probably put you on the map to all the NHL teams at the time. And it's probably, I, I would say it's one of the reasons you went, what'd you go, 46, 47, something like that overall in the, in the NHL I, draft? Yeah, 42nd, I think it was, yeah. in the second round. Yeah. yeah. It was definitely the physical part. It was interesting. Like, it'd be interesting. I had a great time at North Dakota. It worked out well. I have zero complaints. I'm, I have no complaints on having, you know, my career ex exceeded my wildest expectations. But, you know, it would have been interesting to go back. When I went to North Dakota back then, I would say there was, especially being a Western Canadian kid, like, I think there was some connotations that, well, why is he, you know, he's six foot four, 220 pounds, a physical defenseman. Like, why is he not going to the WHL? Why is he going to college hockey where the guys are smaller? You know, there isn't fighting. Like, maybe he's a little bit soft. And so I, I would say there was, like, my physical play that way. And then I tried to every year, once a year, I, I would try, you know, because I don't know what it is now, but back then it was like, you know, one fight, you get a one-game suspension. Two fights, you get three. Yeah. Three fights, you're done for the year. So I would try to, not try to, but I was open to the idea of once a year, if I could, you know, if, if things got a little out of hand, I was going to try and, you know, I, I was going to go after somebody. And it just so worked out that my draft year, um, I got into an altercation with a guy against the University of Wisconsin, and I ended up tuning him up pretty good. I mean, he came after me. I didn't go after him. But that kind of put me on the map, too, where, yeah. oh, okay, you know, maybe this guy isn't. So, anyways. And, yeah, it was, it was time to go. As much as I wanted to come back for my senior year, it was, and it would have been great to win a second national title like yourself, I, or, or at least have an opportunity to, um, it, it was kind of time to go. And I was getting sick and tired of painting dorm room walls for five bucks an hour <laughs> for no money. I'm like... Maybe it's time to see if I can make some cash. Well, you know what? You, it was time to go. You mentioned you were staying at Walsh Hall. Were you ever part of the group that, you know, for the holidays, I don't think everybody understands it. Hockey players, you don't get to go home typically, you know, the holidays. You know, you're playing in tournaments and you're around it. But uh, <laughs> there, there, there were a few groups there that the guys would open up all the windows because everybody went home uh, at Christmas time in, in the dorms and stuff like that. They'd open up the windows and then they'd flood the floors. They'd flood the whole building, and they would freeze, and they'd be skating up and down the halls. Were you were you ever part of any of that? I was never part. You know what? Now that I mentioned that, now that you mentioned that story, I think I remember like hearing about that, like in the years past. And I'm like, yeah. we never did that. I feel like there would have been a massive problem. Oh yeah, if there, we there, would have tried that. Yeah, but, there yeah. is. There was. Well, I heard about that though. Well, so okay. Well, sure <clears throat> Now, here, here's where it starts to get interesting from, from your standpoint for me. So now you get drafted by New Jersey. Have you ever, did you ever put the Jersey, New Jersey jersey on? The only time I did was when I got drafted after my sophomore <laughs> year at the draft in Boston. Okay, but then, but then in there, before you start in Calgary, um, who, who else was in there? It was Anaheim and some. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I misunderstood the question. Yeah, so I signed uh, – once I decided to leave, Lou Lamarillo was the general manager. I had to tell him I was ready to leave college before he was going to offer me any money. Yeah. So I told him, I said, Lou, I'm, I'm ready to go if, if, if you want to have me. He offered me a little bit of money, signed. Uh, <laughs> so I basically ended up my first two years uh, pro. I, I think it's basically the same amount of games. It's 50-some games in New Jersey. 50 some games in Albany. So I was up and down, constantly up and down. And then in after my second year, I got traded to Anaheim, which was my ended up being my first run in with uh, with my boy Mike Babcock. Uh, <laughs> so obviously that didn't work out good. I went I was supposed to play like penciled in. I mean, this was a fairly big trade. I got sent down to the minors in Cincinnati. And I was there the entire year, and, and thank God, I thank him every time I see him. Craig Button, the general manager for the Flames at the time, 
he traded for me would have been the trade deadline of my third year pro my first year with the Anaheim organization. And then I was off to Calgary. Well, and we're going to, we'll, we'll revisit uh, your buddy Babs there in a little while because it, it becomes interesting. And, and, you know, I, it's funny. I think my first year or not my first year, my time in Montreal, I might've had five different coaches and, you know, I, yeah. I kind of went through your coaches. You've, you've had a few coaches in your career. So um, Calgary, Greg Gilbert, and you also had Daryl. Sutter. Uh, I look yeah. at Big Red, um, you know, Gilly. I would think that he would have loved your style and your game. Yeah, it, it was good. The coaching staff in Calgary, like I got along with 99% of the coaches. Calgary was good. Like when I got traded there, I, I, I think I, I was I was on the bus for Cincinnati. We were on the road. I went and played seven games for the St. John's Flames. And then I'm not even really sure why they did this because the St. John Flames were like battling for a playoff spot and the Calgary Flames were definitely out uh, that year in 0203. but they called me up for the last six games of the year, which was fine. Um, so I had a little experience there, spent the summer there. And then, you know, the next year there just wasn't, I had a good camp for myself, I would say, but spent the first half of the year in the minors. Um, yeah. I always get asked for like, you know, some Daryl stories and stuff like that. And Daryl always treated me, the coaching staff, always treated me very well i think they you know what you see is what you get you know if i wasn't playing well it wasn't because of lack of trying i was trying hard and they knew that um and i would show up uh, so like and, and i didn't end up you know I, I live in calgary now or i go back and forth a little bit but i'm mostly in calgary and you know it, i was here at the right time i was here at the last half of before i blew my shoulder up but finished the year and then I was there for the Stanley Cup run that we had in 2004 and I laugh here because you know you go out and still people are I hear about the 2004 run all the time it came out of nowhere and you know people around here a lot of people are like under the impression that that I was in Calgary for like five or six years and I'm like yeah I you know usually I just say yeah thank you very much but I'm yeah. like I mean I played 18 regular season games here in a playoff run that's it yeah but um yeah I, I like Daryl I know he can be he can be very – I think he's a good dude. He was good to me. He pushes buttons. In my opinion, you you need to – he's one of those guys where you – he's going he's gonna to come at you and he's going to push your buttons. And you need to be comfortable with coming back at him. Once you do that, then he's going to respect you. If you let him run all – or walk all over you, you're in for a long year. But you need to stand up for yourself. That's what he respects. And it's, you know, some guys get that. They get it right away. And some guys don't. Being kind of a, a long haul for him. So, but I like them. But you know what? Those are, that's by design. I think that the good coaches try to get everything out of you that they can. And, and I, again, another similarity with us is that we knew that our game wasn't going to be to be trying to pick up the puck and skate from one end of the rink to the other and, and dangle the first guy and maybe the second guy. We, we knew who we were and, and what kept us in the lineup every night. And, and I, think they, I think those coaches appreciate that. And I think they, what they do is they, they wear on the, the, the really good players a little bit too much sometimes only because they want them to be a full 200-foot player, which I think in the old days, we, they all, that's what we all want. I want it today too with our guys. But at, at some point we go, you know, this, he is what he is. And, 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 but it is nice to know that if you can push them to a point and they're going to quit, then, you know, we'll find somebody else. But so, yeah. so you have Daryl, you have Gilly there. And then probably, the, uh, speaking of trades, it, it's probably the best time to be traded that next time um, to Carolina. I mean, talk about things working out. It couldn't work out any better for you. Yeah, like, uh, in, yeah, it literally couldn't. In hindsight, you know, we go to the finals in 04 in Calgary. Um, I finally sign a two-year one-way contract uh, in the NHL. So I'm, I'm excited about that. And, you know, I never really, you know, I didn't, I was always up and down in the union stuff. And, you know, that summer it was like, oh, there's going to be a lockout. I'm like, what do you mean? No NHL hockey? I didn't make it. Like, yeah, right. Yeah. You know, I just didn't think about it. And next year comes, we got a lockout. The whole year is gone, and I'm back in the minors. And so, you know, I'm kind of pissed off a little bit. I'm like, God, back in the American League and that that summer at the draft. And I remember when it happened, I, and I was like, you know, at first I was a little down because I'm like, well, Carolina's not supposed to be very good. You know, I, I enjoyed my time in Calgary. But then I, like, sat and thought about it for about 10 seconds. I mean, 
we had in Calgary, I think there was eight or nine guys. I think there was eight guys on one-way contracts, plus Dion Phaneuf was coming in, which you knew he was going to play. He was a great junior player, and he was a very high draft pick, very highly touted. So looking back, like, uh, you know, after, you know, a few years later, looking back, as much as I bitched about that full-year lockout, and in a lot of ways it was terrible, there's no doubt about it, On a, just purely on a personal standpoint, uh, it's the best thing that happened in my career sure. because I ended up going back down to the minors. At the time, Calgary shared a farm team with Carolina, uh, the Lowell Lock Monsters. Calgary Brass wasn't out there very much just because it was a long ways. Carolina, you know, Peter Laviolette, Jim Rutherford, Jeff Daniels, all these guys were constantly at games because it was just, it was, wasn't very far away. Um, I had a good year. Tom Rowe, who, you know, I thank him whenever I see him too. He was like the first coach. I would say that like really other than Larry Robinson, when I was really young, unfortunately, he, I wasn't around him nearly long enough, but Tom Rowe was like the first guy that was like, Hey, Hey, you're playing. And like, I want you to be physical, but you are going to play. You are k- killing penalties. I'm going to have you on the second power play unit, shoot the puck. You're playing. And I had a really good year. Um, and yeah, ended up getting traded to Carolina and the expectations. I think when we got like, it, we were, we were picked to finish like, and you know, it's the expert opinion before the season. Oh, yeah. gives a shit. Of course. Uh, yeah. You know, I think we were picked to finish like 28th out of 30 teams or whatever it was. Um, and it just, we, we had a really good year that year. I, you know, being, I think the major reason why uh, in Carolina we won the Stanley Cup in 2006 is I think that Jim Rutherford and, and, the, and the staff, I think we were probably, I think it would be fair to say that we probably were the quickest team to adjust to the new rules. We had, you know, forwards that could score. We were a little bit smaller up front, but we could move. And I think that would be, you know, I mean, obviously we were lucky and everything too, but um, I would say that was a, a big reason why why we won that year. Did, did Jimmy make any moves uh, during that season, any trades that were key trades at the time? Or when you got, when you're coming down the stretch with, you know, 30, 20 games to go, did he just kind of let it be? We, we are what we are. Were there any moves? Because I, I don't, I didn't look at any of that. Did you guys make any moves at the time? Yeah, we made two. We made two pretty big moves um, for veteran guys at the deadline or within a week of the deadline. Uh, we ended up picking up, uh, we picked up, Doug Waite from mm-hmm. St. Louis, yep. um, which was a big pickup for us. I mean, I love Doug Waite. And we picked up Mark Recchi, I think, from Pittsburgh. Yeah, those are those are two pretty big moves. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah those are two pretty good <laughs> players. So, yeah. And you know what? They were from, you know, I was just, a, you know, a younger guy, happy to be there. I was finally starting to play like 18, 20 minutes, and I was starting to – me and uh, Brett Hedekin went to bat for me. You know, I was kind of not in and out of the lineup, but Laviolette was playing. And I love Lavi, but he was doing the 7D thing, and I hate that. So I was kind of splitting time with Oleg Tevardoski and, and Brett Hedekin, and I thank him too. I'm like, thank you, Brett. Brett went to the Laviolette and said, hey, I'm done with this. Let's play 6D and put me with Commodore, and oh. which was a huge thing for my career. Sure. And now I'm playing with a guy that can skate. Yep. So, I mean, it was awesome. I didn't have a, I didn't have a, couldn't have a better setup for myself. You know, Brett could skate like the wind, so I didn't have to, you know, when the puck, Brett can go get it. My job, I'm get available for Brett if he needs me, um, and we worked well together. Um, so, yeah, and I mean, Doug was, and I think the biggest, obviously, Doug Waite and Mark Recchi, two huge names. Um, but one thing that they were, you know, that I didn't really find, you know, I did I guess I paid attention a little bit, but I wasn't part of a leadership group or anything. I was just there, and. I was happy to be there working my ass off, but looking back and talking to guys, you know, years later, you know, Doug and and Mark, they were awesome in the fact that, you know, they came in, you know, especially Doug, Doug comes in, you know, in power play guy. I mean, both of them are, don't get me wrong, but these are huge names that came in and they realized, you know, Hey, look like, you know, we aren't going to be, this isn't, I'm not running the show on the power play here. And, you know, I'm going to have a, a reduced role and I might have to do some checking. I mean, they were both unbelievable taking the body. Um, they accepted like different roles and they were still awesome offensively for us, but they realized like, Hey, like, you know, this is Eric Stahl and Justin Williams and Rod Brindamore and, 
and they were great at accepting like their roles for us, and they were awesome. Yeah, those are those are the good additions. The reason I asked that question was I was doing a, a podcast earlier this morning before I came here to do this one with yourself, uh, and the question was about you know the the stars team obviously, and 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 I'm looking at the the Dallas Stars, and I'm like you know if it's me and I'm part of management, whatever it is, um, they've got a they've got a good team, and they've got a team that if anything. You're just going to add a little bit of depth, and you know, eight injuries, a couple extra defensemen, you know, another mm -hmm. uh, four. Because again, I, I'm going to that room and telling this group at a certain point that we believe in who you are. We, you guys are having a good season. We've got we've got older guys, we got young guys. We got a good chemistry going on. Um, you know, they're kind of rolling along, and so that that was that's the only reason I brought that up is because I there are certain teams like the Boston Bruins and Vegas and guys like that that have things going on. Um, Seattle Kraken. I mean, I talk about a surprise yep. team, but but those yeah. th those kind of teams, we'd have never seen that one coming. So what did you do with the Cup when you you guys win the Stanley Cup? And see, uh, my first yeah. one, we never had that policy was in place. I mean, it was just oh, the French. Okay. Guy, yeah, the French guys got to take a carbo, and those guys got to dance around with it in the strip joints and shit like that in Montreal. Oh, what a joke! <clears throat> yeah, I no, mean, we I didn't even know about that till a few years later. Um, so we never had that policy. Thank God that we had the you know the one here in Dallas, and then I got to do that thing. But so what did you do when you had the Cup? Yeah, did you do the Pantera thing? Is that right? Oh, yeah. Part of that? Yeah, I did a few things. Well, we'll get to Pantera and okay. Metallica in a second okay. here. Okay. <laughs> um, I was not with Pantera. I love Pantera, but I was not with them. I had a uh, – I decided to have – I'm like, uh, I think I still might have the record for the most cup parties attended at 12 or 13. I decided, I'm like, hey, I'm going to work my ass off, but if somebody in North America invites me to the party, I'm going. So I did every time. Uh, my – my time with it, it was uh, Ray Whitney and I were on the, we're on Carolina. We're both from Fort Saskatchewan. So we split days. Um, so it ended up being where uh, Ray, Ray's kind of day, we did it at home. We took it back to the fort, to the fort had a little party there. My kind of day, um, to shorten the story up, uh, I did a pub crawl that started at my parents' place in, uh, they were now in Sherwood Park, but basically in Edmonton. I didn't want to go out in Edmonton because we had just beat the Oilers. I'm like, I live in Calgary. I'm like, I'm, I got some buddies with me. I'm like, the last thing I want to do is go out in Edmonton and my buddies have a few drinks and somebody says something. So I'm like, let's go to Calgary. There'll be no problems. And then actually your team kind of, well, not kind of did inspire me. Um, when I was in college, when you guys won in 1999 in Dallas, uh, Ed Belfort brought the cup back uh, to North Dakota. And I was there at the time. And I always thought I was like, Oh, like, that seems like a really cool thing to do. So I was like, ah, you know, if I ever end up making it to the NHL, I'm going to try and do that. So I talked my way into an extra day um, with Carolina. They were nice enough to say, sure. Um, and UND sent a, sent a plane out to pick me up uh, in Calgary, flew me back down to Grand Forks. We had kind of a day and a little celebration with it at the new rink there in, uh, in Grand Forks. And then they flew me home. So was uh, was Frenchie still there in, in North Dakota, or you guys had to have a hangout? Our, ours was called Frenchie's. You guys have a little spot there? Uh, we or a few spots, but normally there's just yeah. one. No, you're right. I remember Frenchie's. I remember the name. I'd never gone in there. There was a place like in East Grand Forks when I was there for my fly down. Whitey's. But then the problem was, uh, yes, there was, there was Whitey's, and then there was another place right next door. That's where they went. I can't remember the name of it. But then when I got to school, that entire area was gone. So the only bar that they had when I was a freshman downtown was Bonzers. So my first year, we went to Bonzers, where they had the best scam going there. They say they're schooners, biggest schooners. It's these heavy-ass schooners. And the one time, I'm like, these beers seem to be going down awfully quick for how big they say these beers are. And then I took a can of beer, dumped it in, and I'm like, this is literally just a beer. Yeah, it's Bonzers, just all glass. Yeah, yeah, it's all glass. Yeah. Like, I'm killing my arms here for nothing. Um, <laughs> that was your first yeah, workout. We, <laughs> first workout from North Dakota, yeah. <laughs> we should have done curls at the Iron Yeah. I'd have been fine there. Uh, but, yeah, I guess the edge ended up being our spot when I was in school. But that okay. didn't start till like, the end of my second year. So then your next move is what? Uh, Ottawa for what? A cup of coffee or what What was Ottawa? Of, Ottawa was a cup of coffee. Uh, Ottawa that year in 2007, they went to the finals and lost to Anaheim in 2007-8. Uh, they were the first 41 games. They were the best team in the league by a landslide. Like they were so far ahead in first place in the East, at least. It was a joke. 
Um, and then I never only really paid attention to my team and who we had coming up, but uh, then they went into a tailspin. Uh, Corey Stillman and I got traded there a week before the deadline. I looked at the standings. I was like, oh, first place. I'm like, cup run in Canada. Like, uh -huh. Awesome. Nation's capital. Figured, yeah. I'm like, I'm fired up. I figured out really, really quick. First game, go in. We're at home. We get beat like 5-1. Second game, go on the road into Jersey. We get spanked like 6-1. I am like, what is going on? <laughs> it was like nobody knew what they were doing in the defensive end. It was it, it was. It was trying times in Ottawa. So if there was one more game in the playoff that year, or sorry, in the regular season, we would have missed the playoffs. We literally lost our way in to seventh place, and we got swept by the Penguins in the first round, and that was it. Done. Howdy duty. Yeah, done. Um, let's go back a little bit. I want. I brought up Metallica earlier. Um, mm -hmm. When did you run into Lars? Weren't you uh, sitting on a pool table chatting with Lars for yeah, a little while? How, how did that uh, roll down? It was awesome. So after when I was when we went to the finals here in Calgary, uh, we played Detroit, the, the President's Trophy winner, load of Hall of Famers. We played them in the second round. Uh, thank you to Mika Kiprasov, our goaltender, yeah. and Jerome McGinley. We somehow managed to beat them, and we beat them in six. And in between, uh, we so we were done with Detroit, and the conference finals was going to be against San Jose. And there was like four or five days in between, or whatever it was. Chris Simon on our team was friends with the bassist Rob from Metallica. And so Chris, he, he, Chris and I ended up hanging out a bunch because we were both in the hotel. And so Chris is like, Hey, you like Metallica? Chris, I'm like, I love Metallica. Mm. He's like, well, they're playing tonight. I got tickets. You want to come? We're going backstage. I'm like, I'm trying to contain my excitement. So I don't look like a door. I'm like, yeah, yeah. You know, thank you for the invitation, Chris. Let's do it. So we go to the concert. Godsmack opened up for him. Uh, Metallica obviously was the headliner. It was awesome. The place was packed. You know, we had just beat Detroit. I had long red hair. I looked like Krusty the Clown running around there. So like we were kind of getting rock stars. Oh, don't worry. Went that back. that picture will be going up in the broadcast. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Without that, nobody recognized me. So you need to fire it up. Um, and we, and so anyways, we ended up going backstage after, and uh, <clears throat> Kirk came out. Lars, uh, Lars didn't come out that time. Rob came out the bassist and guitar, and uh, they're like, "Wait, where are you guys? You guys going out?" I'm like, "Yeah." They're like, "Well, where to, where are you going?" I'm like, "There's really only one kind of place to go." I'm like, "Oh, we're going to Cowboys." They're like, "Okay, we'll see you later." I'm like, "No shit, this is gonna be unbelievable." It's like a Friday night too, so we go over. There was probably six of us or so. We go to Cowboys, and then you know they're not there and they're not there. I'm like, "Ah, maybe they won't show up. Not a big deal." And then all of a sudden. Um, just Rob and Lars showed up that the other two James and Kirk didn't, but they came up the back door and I will never forget. Like, I mean, it was busy up there anyways. And like, you know, we were up there kind of the hot ticket going on right then and there, but then to bring like Metallica up there, like it was, it was something I'd never really seen before. Like, I mean, it was do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And so anyways, Lars and I ended up, uh, I didn't know, but, uh, he's a huge hockey fan. They all are. Yeah. And they were big. Uh, they didn't go out on stage with, you know, usually they'd put like, you know, if there's a band in town, there's a playoff run, right? You put a Dallas Stars jersey on or a Calgary Flames or wherever you are. And they never put a Flames jersey on. And I, I just said, hey, I'm like, you know, I, why not? And they're like, well, Mike, I'm, we live in the San Jose area and we are huge Sharks fans. So we were playing the Sharks Nets. So they're like, we couldn't wear Flames. I go, oh, I get it. Perfect. So, yeah, it was awesome. Talk to him sat on the pool table we were upstairs a bullshit, probably five six in the morning and then that was the end of the night and yeah it's something i'll never forget for sure we uh so the year that we win the cup here in dallas we had beat uh whoever the hell it was in the first round and you know at the time we ended i think it was in four games and so we had like a week off and yeah talking about pantera earlier Vinny calls me up after the game and i'd gotten him tickets for that particular game i think it was and calls me up and he goes hey be at the airport at six o'clock in the morning i'm like what and he goes I, and just you're coming you're coming with us i said Vinny, what are you talking about i said we're in the playoffs he goes i know but you told me tonight you got like four days off we actually i think they gave us three days off and then we we're gonna you know we practice for a few days and start the next round i said i can't do that and i said i'm not doing that no no you you be there and i said no and i hung up on him and i sat down on my couch i was at home and i sat there and I, well i don't think i was at home but wherever i was and i called him back yeah. and i said what time he goes six o'clock so the next morning 
I get there and I said, what's going on? He goes, you're coming with us in Metallica. We're going to Mexico City. And I'm like, what? Oh. Yeah, so I was <clears throat> like, and I got there and I was like, oh man, I can't do this. Mexico City. And I said, <laughs> he goes, nope, you're coming. So I had to call somebody <laughs> staff wise and tell him what was going yeah. on. And he was like, well, why the hell are you calling me? And I said, I don't know. I'm going to Mexico City with Metallica and Pantera. I said, I have no clue what's going to happen. So what had happened, once we get there, um, you kind of walk back through the curtains. It kind of a shitty setup that they had. And because um, Vinny says, come on back, and you can meet Hetfield and Lars and those guys. And I'm like, okay. So I walked to the back, and <clears throat> big bouncer. And I go back, and he goes, uh, Lars is in here. I said, okay. And I, this is when he was clean and sober. Um, so uh -huh. I walked through the curtains, and I'm like, uh-oh. And I said, no, hey, Lars, how you doing? I'm so-and-so, good to meet you. Turn around, the guy says to me, no, no, you're good, you can stay back. I said, no, no, I'm good, I'm going out. So anyways, at the end of the show, Pantera opens up, then Metallica, and then we go out after, and Hetfield says to me, he goes, hey, uh, thanks for coming, all this kind of stuff, do you want an autograph? I said, yeah, sure, I'd love an autograph. So he pulls out the thing, I didn't look at it, and all of a sudden, it's, it's a picture of him, you know, and they're on stage. I'm like, oh, this is cool. So I sign it. Awesome. I get back about... Um, it was probably two months later. We were talking about that after. It was after we won. It was during the summer. I said, oh, that shit, that's right. I got to find that picture. I get the picture. I find it. I pull it out. And it says something like, hey, Luds, nice meeting you. Go Sharks on the bottom of it. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was the big fuck you on that one. <clears throat> so, yeah, but you're right. They're, they're, they're huge hockey fans. So now I want to get to your move to Columbus. And the reason I want to get to move to Columbus, and I'm thinking there was no problem, but I wanted to know because your head coach at the time, or when you were there, at least you had Hitchcock for a time, a little bit of time, didn't you? I wanted to get your thoughts yeah. on Ken Hitchcock. Yeah, I love Hitch. Uh, Hitch was a big reason why I ended up in Columbus. Uh, I've got nothing but, but good things to say about Hitch. Great things, actually. Um, he he was a big fan of me. He was a major reason why I got to Columbus. Um, we had our first year in Columbus was the first year that, or my first year in Columbus was the first year Columbus ever made the playoffs. Um, and then the expectations went up the next year. Guys were hurt, including myself, and we just we missed the playoffs, and they, they ended up firing Ken, which was basically the end of me in Columbus. So I wish Ken would have stuck around uh, a lot longer. What I liked about Ken was um, he's a good dude, first off. Uh, I like the fact, like, you know, obviously the complaint with Ken is he can be overbearing. And, you know, you turn a puck over, you yep. know, two minutes into the game and you you could win the game 6-1. And you're still hearing about this turnover that you did in the first in the first period or whatever. But the thing that I really liked about Ken was, um, and it didn't happen. He he left me alone pretty good, but a couple times it, it did. He was I loved him because he never he knew the game of hockey. He, he knew the game of hockey, uh, out inside and out. I mean, I, I think if if Ken or if Ken Hitchcock, sorry could have just come to something where, you know what, I'm just going to come up with the game plan. I'm going to talk to you guys in the intermission and I'm going to send somebody else out on the bench. Yeah. I think he would have lasted long just because he just wore guys out on the bench. Yeah. But what I loved about him was that, you know, I, I can think of a, one time in particular for sure where, you know, I turned a puck over or whatever, or it wasn't even me actually. It was like Jake Borachek or one of the younger guys. We we're at home, you know, one of the rookies turned a puck over in the first period. It's now like, 10 minutes left in the third period. We're, we're literally up like five or six, one, this game is over. We're winning. And I can hear him harp and hear and harp. Him. And finally I turn around and look at him and I tell him, Hey Ken, you need to shut them in yeah. and go off on him, off on him, shut up. And you know what? He looked at me and, and he, he was like this with everybody. He looked at you and didn't say anything. And then the next morning or after the game, Hey Mike, how you doing? He never took anything personally, which, I appreciate it because he was hard on people, but you could turn around and you could say whatever you wanted to him within like kind of reason. And he, it, he never took it personal. So, so I loved Ken. I, I thought he was a real good dude for sure. Um, yeah, it was, it was really bad for my career when he got Ken. Him getting fired was basically the end of my career. Yeah, it would no, probably I, be a pretty honest thing to say. I, I, I agree with you on, on on all that, and I'll tell you, I get a call from from Hitch, and we we keep in contact, and and I'm going to have him on, on this thing uh, in a, in a while, but. Um, I, I remember him just, to, you know, because he was hard. Everything was detailed. You know where he, where he, 
where he screwed us up more often than not was in practice when we we're doing all these drills and then he'd always go up to the board you know how he was left-handed and he'd write that start drawing on the board and I'm like hitch like just give us a name to the drill because you go up there and you start drawing this and that and then it's like we don't know what the hell you're talking about because you know he's going off and I'm like and then we go oh that drill the same drill that we do every day it's just you know I mean right. he was very <clears throat> it was repetition for him um yeah. but but it was a few years later and and hitch was in uh St. Louis I believe and just to tell you that he re he realized that he had to um, change his style a little bit. He had asked me, he goes, hey, I need you to write me something about um, how you handled me in Dallas. And and I was like, what? And so we talked a little bit about it. But but he recognized that he, with the generation, you know, the kids coming in and a little bit different than, than what we were, and he just wanted to know, how did you talk to me? How did you handle that and that? And so I, I give him a ton of credit, though, you know, exactly yep. what you're saying. So uh, did you ever buy any houses anywhere? I mean, you know, the kiss of death is as soon as you buy a house. So I, I'm hoping you didn't buy a lot of houses at every stop. <laughs> That's a great. You're actually the first person that's ever asked me that. Well, I, I just want to know. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's a great question. I bought one house throughout the 14 years of my career. I bought a house when I signed a five-year deal in Columbus. Boy. And it was, I had it for, it actually ended up working out really good. I loved, Columbus always gets shit on. Like, you know, guys leaving, don't like it there or whatever. And for the life of me, like, I understand it's not a, it's it's not Boston or it's not, yeah. you know, Montreal. It's not a hockey, hockey market, but I loved it there. I, I had a place like from my bedroom to my stall was a 15 minute walk. In between there were all the bars and restaurants. Ohio State was half a mile north of, my, of me. Our practice rink was right in the big arena. And the airport was 15 minutes away. Like, I loved it there. I had a lot of fun. The fans were, like, Buckeye is, you know, obviously, you know, college football, Ohio State Buckeyes is, is king. And it doesn't matter if the Blue Jackets could go, go out and win the next 10 Stanley Cups in a row. That ain't changing. Right. But once the Buckeye season ends, like, if you have a decent team there, like, they'll show up. And they will make some noise. So, I loved it in Columbus. I had that house for... That was the one, the most disappointing, like I would say the, the one thing in my, a lot of stuff didn't work out, but I would say the, the, the number one thing for me that I was disappointed with in my career was I, I really wanted it to work in Columbus. And when I signed a five-year deal, deal there, you know, I, I wanted, I mean, I really wanted to, you know, I'm not saying win, but I wanted to, you know, make the playoffs a couple times and like be a threat a little bit. And the fact that, you know, I basically made it two and a half years through that contract and, and that was the end of it. That was that was probably the most disappointing thing in my career. Well, sure. so do you have so what are your thoughts on is does a lot of that or any of that have to do with Johnny Goudreau? When, when he decided, I mean, he kind of threw a curveball at everybody. I, you know, they were talking about I, I think it was Jersey and they're talking about Philly. And all of a sudden Goudreau, um, you know, from Calgary signs in Columbus. Any do you have any have you ever heard any uh, explanation why he did that, by the way? You know what? I've never heard an explanation. All I just whatever he said when he was did did kind of the interview, it was a big deal here, obviously in Calgary, because people were like, you know, they wanted him back, and he he wasn't a good player. You know what? He, I had some issues with. I think he's an excellent player. I think he's very fun to watch. Three on three, I don't know if there's anybody better for their money. You know, to watch for your money, power play. You know, my kind of complaints were him were like, yeah, but when the game gets hard, when we get to the playoffs, I'm sitting here watching Johnny Goodrow and all he's doing is waving his hands around trying to draw a penalty, pretending that he's hurt instead of playing. But in saying that, last year he was way better in the playoffs. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I have a controversy. I've said this, and I do not know if it's true. I said this here on the radio, and some people got pissed off, but. You know, people were like, why, why, why? It makes no sense. Columbus sucks, this and that. We have a good team. And to me, I just kind of looked at it in a different way. Um, I just looked at it, and I said this on the radio when people were kind of miffed at me. Johnny Gaudreau had just gotten married. His wife is from New Jersey or from Philadelphia, from out east, where he's from. The only two years that his wife, who's in the healthcare industry apparently, spent in Canada, in Calgary, was the two years of COVID. So she barely got to go outside. There's 
all these COVID rules and mandates left and right. You can't do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to jump through a bunch of hoops if her, you know, her family or somebody wants to come visit. There's nobody in the stands. Everything's rocking down in the States and we're still shut down out here. You can't go in a restaurant. You got to wear a mask. I'm like, you know what? I'm like, why would she want to come yeah, back? Yeah, Not exactly. The wife? Yeah. You know what I mean? So I looked at it like that where it's like, and maybe he's sick of it too. I'm like, you guys, we're sitting here in Calgary thinking, oh, like the team is good. And I'm like, yeah, that's a huge thing. But I'm like, take a look at how the lifestyle's been here the last two years. It's a joke. Sure. So I'm like, I I'm not going to sit here and blame this guy for wanting to go to the U S and if he wants to go to Columbus, go to Columbus. Now I think Columbus is a, is a good town. They aren't a very good, not team. a very good They're team though. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, they are. They are. And they got some work to do there that way. They got to get a lot tougher. Um, but that was kind of how I looked at it. And I know it's, you know, nobody wants to mix that with sports, but it's like, yeah. Okay. You're at the rink for three hours a day. You got to live the rest of your life. Like, it's been terrible here. Like in some fashion, you have to understand that, but some people don't. Well, we've we've talked about some of your coaches: Dean Blay, Greg Gilbert, Sutter, uh, Hitchcock. Let's go to the let's go to the Mike Babcock. Um, where My did boy. it go? Where did it go sideways with you and Babs? Well, it went sideways because because uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say Chelly would agree with anything that you're gonna say right now. He's got a he, we know the story oh. with him him and Babs too, right? At the Winter Classic and everywhere else. I mean, if there's, I'll <laughs> I'll, I'll tell part of the story that has to do with Chelly. I mean, people think I hate Chelly or hate Mike yeah. Babcock. Yeah. Go have a conversation with Chris Chelios. Um, long story short, otherwise I could talk way too long. Uh, my first run in ever hearing Mike Babcock's name, ever seeing him at. In, I, I had no idea who he was, no clue. Uh, I get traded to Anaheim in the summer after my second year pro. I get a call from a, a number. Hey, Mike, it's it's Mike Babcock, head coach of the Anaheim Mighty Ducks. Hey, how you doing, Mike? Good. Hey, make sure you show up in shape this year. Go, Sounds good. No problem. I'll be there. Okay, great. That's the end of it. I go to California early. I'm skating. I'm like, it's a big opportunity for me. Me and Peter Sikora get traded for Jeff Friesen and Oleg Tabardoski. There's like, when you're looking at the kind of thing, you know, who's going to be playing on the decor, you know, I'm penciled in there like five, six, seven, potentially. Uh, I get there and, you know, training camp goes, I'm working hard, fight a couple guys in camp. Not, he's not playing me any exhibition games. And I'm starting to like get the impression I'm working for him were kind of probably like halfway through camp and there was like a systems thing. So long story short, pucks in the other end of the ice. I'm coming up through the face up dots in like the neutral zone. Mike Babcock's to my right. I go, Hey Mike, you know, would you like me here or over here? As the play is going on, the puck is eight, like 60, 70 feet away. He blows it down, starts screaming at me. I'm like, this guy's an idiot. <laughs> then I'm out in the ice and I'm like, that's kind of, I'm getting warnings. This now, I'm not playing much in the exhibition games, and I should be. And he come over to me, and I, uh, you know, we're doing some shooting after uh, shooting and passing after the practice, you know, the decor. Now, this is like I'm going into my third year pro, and there was, a, and I got nothing against this guy. He was a very nice guy. But there's this D man named Kurt Sauer, who's just fresh out of junior, went to Spokane, where Babs coached um, years prior. And look, there, I have nothing against Kurt Sauer, but he was pretty rough around the edges, big guy, kind of soft, not real offensive. And so Babs comes over to me. He's like, hey, Mike, you need to watch that guy. Play like that guy. Watch what he does. So I'm standing next to the boards to him. I'm watching Kurt Sauer. I watch him airmail passes, fan on shots, doesn't hit the net, not getting in the air for the tip. I turn to Babs and go, are you serious? I go, that guy isn't even close to ready. And Babs just skates away. Anyways, Babs sends me to the minors. Right away. <laughs> my, big, my big issue with him wasn't the fact that he, you know, he wanted, he liked his boy, Kurt Sauer. Fine. That happens every year. No problem. My issue was with him was instead of just saying, hey, you know what? You know, he got asked, well, where's, where's Commodore? Like, he's supposed to play. What are, you, what are you doing with him? Instead of just being like, you know what? I want to see this Kurt Sauer. You know, he's, he, we're, we'll get him up later or say whatever. He goes to the media and says, well, he showed up. He wasn't in shape. I don't think he really cares. He wasn't ready to play. 
So says that to the paper. Now all of a sudden I've got a reputation. Meanwhile, mm-hmm. I showed up in great shape. I was fighting people in camp. I don't know what else I could have done. Yeah. Um, so anyway, some other things went on that year that were a joke, like, cause I was down in Cincinnati and just a bunch, like calling me up to Columbus to do like, they did this fat test, like six weeks, two, two months into the season, I'm playing three and threes. My body weight is exactly the same, if not lighter than when I was in training camp. They call me up to Anaheim. They're not even going to play me. They call me up and they want to do a fat test. The, and it was a North Dakota guy too, the athletic trainer, mm-hmm. first year guy. Um, he kind of screwed me. So he's like, "Hey, we need to do a fat test." You know these fat tests where you're pinching. It was yeah, I was going to say point... it just depends on how much they want to grab. Big time. Yeah. So it's a three point test. I am. I've been playing nothing but threes and threes and four and fives in Cincinnati. I'm playing 20, 18, 20 minutes a night. I'm the exact same weight that I was prior in training camp. My body fat then was like 10 or 11. That's what kind of what I was when I was in good shape. This guy does the fat test. My body fat's 24. <laughs> <laughs> so Is that called obese goes, yet? Is that obese yet or no? Yeah. He's like, <laughs> hey, Mike, you know, you're, you're, I think it was 23.8. Hey, your body fat's 23.8. I go, Sean, I go, look at the scale, dude. I go, look at me. I go, I'm the exact same as I was two months ago. I go, obviously that's wrong. He's like, I got to tell Babs. I go, go tell Babs. I go, I don't give a shit what you do because I'm done here anyway. But I go, that's fine. So he tells Babs. Babs waits until in front of the guys, tries to embarrass me. I tell him a bunch of where to go. Anyways, thank God Craig Button trades for me. Um, And my big thing with Babs. So now, you know, two years ago, I go to Calgary. Babs goes to Detroit and Carolina, whatever. I'm in Columbus now. I rip them in the paper when I'm in Columbus the first time Detroit comes to town um, I find out Chelly and Osgood those guys cut out the articles highlight the parts where I'm ripping them because they loved it we ended up beating Detroit in overtime I actually had a couple of points I assisted on the overtime winner I'll never forget I was so <laughs> pumped um, anyway things go sideways in Columbus on me and uh, I'm now bought out now this is my big thing with Babs uh, so Bought out at the, end of, at the end of June, sorry. Free agency starts the next day. I'm friends with Ken Holland, who is the general manager of Detroit. Babs is the head coach in Detroit. I'm friends with Ken. I played in his, a couple of his golf events. I've had beers with him, ripping on Babs, whatever. I like Ken, though. Ken likes me. So end of June, talk to my agent. He's like, yeah, it's probably going to be, you know, you're getting, obviously, you're bought out. Maybe you get another chance. Maybe wait something in August. I go, cool, sounds good. Next day. Phone rings. I'm in Kelowna, British Columbia. It's five minutes into free agency. My agent, he's like, hey, I got a contract offer. I'm like, cool. I go, well, what is it? He's like, one year, one million bucks. I'm like, awesome. I'm not going to get any more than that coming off a buyout. I'm like, well, who is it? He's like, Detroit. This agent was different than when I had Babs the first time. And I say, well, I'm not going to Detroit. There's only one reason why Babs wants me in Detroit, and that's to end my career. This is my last opportunity. I understand this. If he doesn't, if I go there and he doesn't play me at all, I'm done. Tell him the story a little bit. He's like, well, I'm like, just put them off. Like literally free agency just started. Nobody, no other team is thinking of calling me for weeks, like to put them off or something. <laughs> My agent goes, well, Ken told me, he said, tell Mike that he's got 15 minutes to make up his mind. We either need to know he's in or he's out. If he's not in, in 15 minutes, I'm going a different direction. So now I'm like, are you shitting me? So I'm like, I'll call you back to my agent. So I call Ken Holland. I'm like, Ken, I'm like, I'd love to play for you. I would love to play in Detroit. I'm like, you guys are good. You're going to make the playoffs. I'm like, I love playing in Joe Lewis Arena. I'm like, I would love to play in Detroit. I'm like, you know what I think you're head coach. Is it you that wants me? Does he want me to? Is he going to, is he going to screw me over? No, you know, he says he wants you. I'm like, Ken, do you believe him? He's like, yeah, I do believe him this time. I go, give me his number. Give me his number. I call Babs. Hey, Mike. I go, Babs, I go, please be honest with me. Free agency just started. Do you want me on your hockey team or not? This is my last opportunity. I just got bought out. You know this. I know this. This is my last chance. Do you want me on the hockey team or not? Are you going to give me an opportunity or not? Or are you just getting me here to end my career? This is it for me. I understand that. No, 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 Mike. We need a right-handed defenseman. We need a physical presence. We need somebody to play with Nick. 
I'm like, Babs, last chance. There's no hard feelings here. If you don't want me, I'm going to say no, and I'll go somewhere else, else, hopefully later in the summer. No, no, no. I need you, need you, want you, blah, blah, blah. Hang up the phone. <laughs> I got five minutes left before this contract's gone. With no guarantee I'm going to get anything if I let this pass. So my gut is screaming, don't go to Detroit. You know this guy. He All he's going to want to do is screw you. Call my agent. He's like, what do he say? I, I'm like, well, he said this. He's like, what do you, I go, I think he's going to screw me. He's like, Mike, you know, play with Nick a little bit. Like, man, you're going to be in the playoffs. And so then I start thinking about that. I'm like, oh, Nick Lidstrom, yeah. D to D, that's going to yeah. be 30, 40 <laughs> points for me. This is going to be an awesome year. So I take Babs at his word, sign that contract, get in there. And I was out from the word go. Like he wouldn't even let me practice. I wasn't able to do all the drills. He was calling guys up from the minors to keep me scratched. Like it was a disaster. Why, and, uh, why, and why do you think, I mean, and there, and so Kenny's got to pay you. I mean, you're getting paid. So yeah. I, I don't understand the, you think he actually brought you in there to end your career? There's no doubt. <laughs> There's no doubt. Like th th at no point during that season, did he even like, like consider playing me? And like, like the first game I didn't play until I think my first game with the Red Wings was like the first half of November. I haven't played an NHL game in like almost a year, except the exhibition. He played me in a couple exhibition games and like, he's calling up guys from the minors to keep like, I'm sitting there, I'm healthy. Like, Oh, you want to change the lineup up or somebody gets dinged up? Like, no, nope, you're staying, you're not playing. I'm going to call up Brendan Smith or whoever else from the minors. So, like, he's going out of his way so I don't play. My first game that I played there, Ian White took a puck to the face, and we had a game the next day against St. Louis, and he didn't have enough time to call somebody up from Grand Rapids. So he was either dressing 5D or he had to play. So he played. He, I'm in the lineup. So before the game, I'm like, okay, I got to make an impression. I got to do something, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> first period, I play, like, 30 seconds, maybe, <laughs> something like that. Second period, maybe another shift, maybe, early in the period. Now I'm sitting there, and it's now two minutes left in the third period. I have checked out of this game about an hour and a half ago. I haven't come close to going on the ice. My feet are killing me. And Bill Peters is the D coach. There's kind of a scramble in front of our bench with two minutes to go, tie game. He panics. He's like, Mike, go. I turn around. I go, are you serious? He's like, go. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So I go to get over the boards, trip over my own feet, fall right on the, like, fall right on my face at the blue line. I get up quick. I got Alex Steen coming down on me with a full head of steam. I'm flat footed. I'm like, oh my God, strong side post, strong side post, strong side post. Keeps me the outside. Managed to do that. He goes around behind the net. Cronwall was out there with me. He's not paying attention because he's supposed to pick him up. So he goes around the net into the other corner. So I'm like, well, I got to take him. So I go running at him, and I'm like, I'm going to put this guy in the third deck. I go to hit him. He stops, goes the other way. I trip over my own feet, go face first into the boards. I'm like, oh, my God. He didn't, I didn't even touch him. Pick myself up off the ice, post back to the net. Steen had taken it to the net, kind of shot it, went off Jimmy Howard's pads. Now it's like the ultimate nightmare. The puck goes off his pads, and now it's on my tape. Now I got the puck, which is the last thing that I want. So I take it around behind the net. I'm like, I'm looking in the middle, and I'm looking on the boards. If I don't see somebody there, this puck is chipped off the glass, and I'm getting the hell off this ice. I have no business being out here. I look in the middle. There's nobody there. There's nobody on the wall. I just, just go to chip it off the glass. As I go to chip it, the puck jumps. I shoot it 15 rows into the stands. Two minutes to play a game final. <laughs> That was my first spin. I can't remember what happened in the game. I know they didn't score on the power play. But then I was scratched again until January. So, yeah, there's no – I don't know why he didn't want anything to do with me. I had never had anything to do with them, period, before I met him in Anaheim. So I really don't know what it was ever. He's gone on record like a couple times, like in the last couple years, because obviously I spent – I spent, well, I've eased off since he got canned in Toronto, but I spent four or five years ripping him online. Um, and he's, you know, he said, well, you got to be able to play. But it's like, dude, like I've, <laughs> like I get what you're saying. Like if you're looking for Nick Lidstrom, I'm not your guy. Yeah. But it's like, dude, I also accomplished some things. 
and you're sitting here telling me that I can play and that you're going to give me an opportunity. So I know you're full of shit. So I don't, for the life of me, I, I don't think I'll ever know what it was or what it is. Maybe it's just one of those things he didn't like the looks of me. I have no clue. Well, just, just thank him in, in a way for that million-dollar contract. You got a little bit of cash out of that miserable last year or years. Um, Tommy, yep. <laughs> I, I just want to say I, I appreciate you coming on today. Um, I look forward to seeing you in March. I will tell you that much. Yeah. We will connect yeah, then. Maybe we'll, do a pod, maybe we'll do this podcast from the suite. We'll go meet in the afternoon. And then yep. we'll do the podcast that night from up there. Um, listen, I, tell that, let that let Jr. know I'm let let Jeremy Roenick know. Let Jr. know I'm coming for him next. I know that you played uh, golf, I think, with Jared Deruby from Talent Core, and um, when he was out there with you guys. Yeah. Where'd you guys go? Arizona or something like that? A month or so ago. They came, yeah, they came with the squad. So yeah, first part of December, we played uh, Jared and Jr. Hooked up. We played Silverleaf. And then uh, we played Whisper Rock. I'm a member of Whisper Rock, and they hooked up Silverleaf. It was fun. What, JR, what? I'll tell you what, JR can play golf. I'm a hack. Like, I'm a decent hack. I mean, I don't really know where the ball is going. JR is pretty good. Is it, is it still a beer hole, I hope? Uh, not quite? I don't think it's not quite. No, he wasn't on a beer hole, but he was, he was tagging a couple back. I think yeah. he likes to get a couple in him quick. Loosen up. A couple double yeah. uh, before the tee. Yeah. And then I think he just likes to kind of coast. And then just kind of bang out a double quick and then coast. Whatever it is, it works. He's good. Yeah. All right, brother. Uh, Mike Commodore, formerly known as Krusty the Clown. Now, you got a shout-out from George Bush, though, when you guys visited the uh, White House, right? Didn't he give you a little shout-out? Yeah. Yeah? That, was, that must be... George, is that, yeah. Yeah, is that, that is nice. that quote hanging on your wall or anything like that in your room? You know what? If I owned a house right now, I, I would <laughs> hang it up on the wall. But I am completely homeless. Wait, wait you can't get something. traded anymore. I don't think you can get traded now, can you? I know I don't think so, but I just I, I keep thinking it's going to happen. So I'm just I'm renting. I got I, the only thing I own right now is a 2006 Corvette. I own a truck that I won in a raffle, and I'm renting a place in Calgary. And I'm like the king of Airbnbs right now. Whenever I travel, God bless you. You're doing what you want to do, though. I love it. All right, <laughs> Tommy, you. man. I, I appreciate you coming on. Enjoy your day, folks. Another episode of. Um, Suds with Luds. I hope you enjoy this one. And and if you can't see it, there will be a picture of Krusty the Crown up on this one, or Krusty the Clown. You may have to tune in to see it. Kami, thanks much. Talk to you later. Thanks, Luds. Appreciate it. I'll you, see you soon. You got it.